So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa pulisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpkey is here for you. Serpkey is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and other visual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things. 
clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila C.R., and I will be your moderator. Friends, in today's webinar, which is our last virtual event for this year, we will talk about another very important topic. This time, it's about the National Expenditure Program, also called the President's Budget. The National Expenditure Program, or NEP, refers to the totality of the budgets of the various departments of the national government, including the national government support to the local government units and government-owned and controlled corporations. It is what the national government plans to spend for its programs and projects. It also states the envisioned sources of its funds. 
The NEP is submitted to Congress to assist in the review and deliberation of the proposed national budget for the legislation of the annual appropriations for the next fiscal year. This afternoon, we will examine how the President's Budget for 2022, or the NEP, embodies the identified priority needs in recovering from the pandemic and given the increased devolution that will take place next year. To officially open our virtual event, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniseto Arbeta, Jr. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the following. From the government, we have the Department of Agriculture and the Secretary uh, Rosan Burgunio, National Economic Development Authority, Assistant Secretary Greg Pineda, Assistant Regional Director of CEO Ding, uh, Department of uh, Interior Local Government Assistant Secretary Esther Aldana, Department of uh, Social Welfare and Development Assistant Secretary Justin Bani, House of Representative CPBRD Director General Romulo Mira, Chief Director Nobel Bangsal, Department of Finance, Bureau of Local Government Finance, Acting Regional Director Vera Daradar and Maria Sodora Gasco. From the private sector, we have Makati Business Club Executive Director Kuku Alcoa. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following. Western Mindanao State University President Maria Carla Ossotoro, University of San Carlos President Narciso Julian, Eliman University Vice President for Development Jane Annette Villarmino, University of the Philippines Virata School of Business Dean Joel Santore, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Dean Vieta Fonte and Antonio Mali. From the CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have Asia. Asian Development Bank Consultant Brian Mahoney, Cuban Business for Social Progress President and CEO Ronaldo Laguda, uh, Philippine Councilors League Director for Advocacy and Program, Gina Perez, CN News Organization Philippines Chief Executive Minister Care, Justin Ho. Let me acknowledge uh, friends from the media, and finally, let me also greet our guests, colleagues from government, academic, society, media private sector and those who are watching through the PIDS and their Facebook pages. As the end of the 2021 draws here, Congress is busy scrutinizing the national budget for, for the 2022 general appropriations bill. Number one, the Senate approved the third and final reading the proposed budget for 2022. The proposed national budget submitted to the Department of Budget Management amounts to uh, five point two two four billion pesos guided by the strategy uh, supported by three main pillars namely building resilience amidst the pandemic sustaining the momentum towards recovery and continuing the legacy of infrastructure 2022 national expenditure program or NE project will be discussed this afternoon with the features of the idea study Titled Analysis of the 2022 President's Budget, authored by PID Research Fellow Justin Bokosika, a senior research specialist for Hector Palomar. Study provides an overview, overall perspective of the budget and examines how the 22 NEEP embodies the priorities identified by the national government. So, so Justin Bokosika so will uh, tell us how the President's Budget. For 2022, plans to address many of the issues that have provided the business to minimize economic and human strain, gaining strategic infrastructure investments to support uh, economic growth as well as continued uh, COVID 19 management. Also important to look at 22, 22 uh, national budgets in line with the implementation of the Supreme Court rules, uh, which expands the local government share in the National tax Based on this, their analysis, the largest share of the 22 million services followed by economic services. The remaining budget is distributed across general public services, debt service, national defense, and Moreover, the 2022 proposed national budget equivalent to 22.8% of the gross domestic product 
and is higher by 11.5% of the current Q1 budget. Thus, lawmakers must ensure that the budget allocation should provide the necessary funding requirements to support the country's development target for 2020. To enrich our discussion, we invited as discussed Director Analisa Zunogawa of the Department of Interior and Local Government, Mr. Fabian Snyder, a lead public uh, sector specialist at the World Bank, and Dr. Alvin Ang, professor at the Ateneo of Manila uh, University, Department of Economics at the Campus Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are honored to have you. So to thank our, uh, thank our viewers, and I hope that you will stay until the end of the webinar and after the party during the open call. Thank you, and I'll give back the floor to the Thank you very much, Dr. Urbeta. So uh, before we proceed to the presentation, allow me to remind you about our house rules for those who are joining us uh, for the first time, or um, if you miss, in case you miss hearing the recording before we started the webinar. So to join the open forum, just use the chat box located at the lower part of the WebEx screen. Just type your name and affiliation and your question and send it to all panelists or to everyone and not to a particular person. I will read your question during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions uh, concise. And for our viewers on Facebook, you are also uh, very much welcome to participate. Just type your comment or your question in the uh, comment section, and I will read up to two relevant questions during the open forum. At this point, I now invite all of you to pay attention to our featured study for this webinar. Um, so we are giving our presenter a maximum of 25 minutes and our discussants up to 15 minutes each. Okay. So as mentioned by Dr. Urbeta, our featured uh, PID study for uh, uh, this webinar is um, authored by uh, Dr. Justin Seacott and Mr. Uh, Robert uh, Hector Padomar. And to present the study is Dr. Justin Seacott. She is a research fellow at PIDS. Uh, she has a PhD in business administration, a PhD in economics um, candidates, um, PhD in economics candidacy and uh, master's degrees in uh, management and economics, all from UP Diliman. Her academic and professional experience is focused on public sector economics and political economy. As a former uh, professor at UP Diliman, she has she taught courses on public sector and development economics and fiscal and monetary, uh, monetary policy. She is also an international consultant in the areas of public expenditure and financial management at the national and local government levels. Dr. Uh, Sikat, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you for that, Sheila. Um, I'm just waiting for the permission to share my, my contents. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank my co-author, um, Mr. Robert Palomar, as well as those who helped us in the study, uh, Ms. Rixi Madawin, Ms. Um, Lucy Melendez, and uh, Ms. Angel Castillo. So this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you the results of our analysis of the 2022 President's Budget. And the focus of this particular study actually is, is highlighted in this particular slide. There will be major shifts in Philippine governance come 2022. There will be a new president administration. There will also be new national and local officials. At the same time, since 2019, um, the national government and local governments have been preparing for the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling, which um, ultimately broadens the base on which the intergovernmental fiscal transfers, formerly known as internal revenue allotments, now to be known as national tax allotments, is computed, which will result in increased resources available for local governments, which, however, were also decided that there would be devolution transitions in the sense of increased responsibilities as well of already devolved functions in the local government code. So we'll be discussing that in more detail later on. But apart from that, also the Philippines will still be having to manage the now endemic COVID-19 and recovering from the economic contraction of 9.5% in 2020. 
Now, the policy question and objectives of this analysis is very simple. On the outset, I want to make it clear that we will be examining the president's proposed 2022 budget for the National Expenditure Program. And we will see how this will address the priority needs in managing COVID-19 and pump priming the economy. So the objectives in particular would be to examine the NEP distribution versus the identified priorities of the um, uh, president. Now, with the implementation of the Mandana Supreme Court ruling, we will also look at budgetary allot adjustments and allocations of national government programs that offer support to local governments and see the overall impact when it comes to, to the national budget. Now, the priorities of the president's 2022 budget are articulated in the national budget call, which is typically issued December of the preceding fiscal year or early in the year of the fiscal year the draft the budget is supposed to be uh, of uh, or January of the year prior to the budget um, fiscal year. So the national budget call of 2022 identified spending priorities or priority administrative policies in designing the budget to include the zero to 10 point social economic agenda and the Philippine Development Plan, the updated 2017 to 2022 public investment program, and the approved 2022 to 2024 three year, three year rolling infrastructure program. So here would be some of the build, build, build projects. Now, there was also articulated in the NBC the strengthened vertical and horizontal linkages through aligned national and regional development plans, prioritizing the needs of the poorest disadvantaged but well-performing LGUs in their sectors. Now, still on the priorities of the President's 2022 budget as articulated in the national budget call, this is in line with the Mandana's ruling. So um, national governments should refrain from including proposals funding devolved local projects for the first to fourth income class LGUs. They should limit subsidies for local projects to LGUs to the fifth and sixth income classes. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, the Philippines categorizes or classifies our local governments according to their income. First would be the richest and sixth would be the poorest. So the directive in the national budget call would be to prioritize spending for the fifth and sixth income class municipalities or those that uh, LGUs or those that have geographically isolated and depressed areas or GDAS. Or in addition, those with the highest poverty incidence ranked up, ranked in top third highest. Now, apart from this, NGA should also include funding requirements for capacity building for these LGUs to enable them to, to be able to spend the increased revenues that, uh, yeah, the increased resources that they will be receiving, as well as the assumed functions that they will be also absorbing. And um, this is actually also very crucial um, because one of our previous studies at the uh, PIDS found that um, the development planning processes of municipalities needs to be improved. Now, the overarching theme of the NEP is sustaining the legacy of real change for future generations. And there are two aspects that we will focus on in our particular analysis of the president's budget. First, we, uh, it prioritizes funding for COVID-19 response measures, including healthcare development and social services. And second, it also plans to sustain public sector investments, primarily through infrastructure spending, to restore it to the pre-pandemic growth trajectory. <clears throat> now, what is the framework and methodology? First of all, it's important to understand that the national budget is a common resource. And according to public sector theory, typically being a limited resource, there's a negative externality imposed by those that get a larger share, since this would reduce the share of other agencies and sectors if we're talking about the national budget. So therefore, the approach of this study will be to examine the 2022 NEP according to the declared budgetary priorities and its distribution across the sectors and subsectors, which I'll be sharing later on. And relative to its historical budgetary priorities, we have data, uh, secondary data from DBM, BSP, and PSA, which date back to 1983. So this is what we will be using to analyze and compare the, the trends in uh, the, the, the changes in the current budget, the purpose, proposed budget for 2022. Now, it's also important to take a step back and, you know, situate what the importance of understanding this, this objective is. And I'd like to just briefly talk about, you know, macroeconomic theory and policy on economic growth and aggregate demand. Now, for economic growth theory, 
it was trying to explain why some economies are richer than others and why some continuously grow compared to others. And there are two, there are two um, general schools of thought. The first would be the neoclassical growth theory, which suggests that the way an economy grows would be through investment in physical capital, and this would be infrastructure. But then a shortcoming of this neoclassical growth theory is that it explained economic growth only up until a certain point. And this is where endogenous growth theory came in. It redefined capital to include not just physical capital and infrastructure, but also highlight the importance of investing in human capital, particularly knowledge and research and development to continuously make um, people more productive and contributing more to the economy. And that's the importance of both investments in human capital and in physical capital, such as infrastructure. But that's the long, long run theory. The short run theory of aggregate demand by Man Q 2019 showed here would give you the national income accounting identity here, which shows that the national income or the national output or GDP as we know it is comprised of consumption spending, which is a function of taxes, investment spending, which is a function of interest rates, and government spending, which is basically the budget that we are describing, we're going to be analyzing today, as well as net exports, which is a function of the real exchange rate. And here it's clear to see the policy lever tools available to the public sector, which would be through government spending or taxes and through maintaining interest rates. And this would all affect the different variables such as consumption goods, investment goods and services, as well as government purchases. And I just like to, in the interest of time, just highlight the government purchase here is defined as goods and services bought by national and local governments, including transfer payments to individuals such as social security and welfare benefits, though these are not part of GDP, since these are simply redistributing existing income. But military equipment, highways, basic health and education services, it's as if the national government through the budget is behaving as a consumer and purchasing goods and services in the economy, which would hopefully lead to the multipliers, the fiscal multipliers that we hear. So if, for example, like at PIDS, our services or my services before at UPP as a teacher, I got paid for my services by the government and I use that income and spend it in the economy. And this is how multipliers happen. So my what I spend in the economy would be the income of those receiving it, and they also would spend in turn. So this is the hope um, of how GDP could also be um, could also pick up through the fiscal multipliers. Now, let's take a look at the expenditure distribution by expense class. So there are three expense classes: there's capital outlay, there's current operating expenditures, and there's net lending. In the 2022 NEP or the President's budget. Um, the majority or 74.2% of it will go to current operating expenditures, which comprises of personal services and maintenance and other operating expenditures. 25.2% of it will go to capital outlays and the rest would go to, to net lending. Now for the past 40 years, if you look at the right side of this particular slide, um, capital, uh, current operating expenditures has received the largest share averaging about 79%. Now let's take a look in more detail at infrastructure and other capital outlay expenditures. So this is as a percent of GDP, 1983 to 2022 figures. So infrastructure and other capital outlay peaked in 2017. So capital outlay is the 25.2% I mentioned earlier. It is the highest most uh, graph here, um, uh, line here. Um, below it would be infrastructure and other capital outlay, which peaked in 2017 to be 6.5%. And it dipped, um, of course, because of uh, the pandemic, and it's recovering, hopefully, to recover at 5.9% in the proposed 20, 2022 budget. Now, in the past decade, this has averaged about 4.4% of GDP compared to the previous decade um, where it averaged only about 1.8% of GDP. So I think that moving forward, we should still try to maintain um, this, uh, this, uh, this goal of uh, higher spending of GDP on uh, infrastructure and capital outlay. Now let's take a look at the uh, Philippine expenditure distribution by sector. So we have the major sectors here. We have general public services, social services, economic services. We have defense, debt servicing, and net lending. So I'm just reporting this um, for completion, but really the productive services of the, uh, the productive sectors would exclude debt servicing, and that's what's used to compute the primary balance. But here we see social services is poised to get a 3% increase from 2021 and the largest share of the budget at 
This is 38.3% of the 5.024 trillion proposed president's budget. Okay. Now, the second would be economic services, although its share is dipping slightly um, to 29.3%. Um, and we'll see later on that the reason why is because um, gov uh, the president's budget shows priority more for the social services as well as the general public services, um, not just because of trying to address social protection, but also because of the increase in the subsidies to LGUs. So we'll see it in the later slides. But in any case, you could see the trend here. Ever since 1995, this, this dark brown um, trend line here shows that social services has always received the largest um, share of the budget. Now let's take a, take a look at the subsector distribution. So this is the social service distribution from 1983 to 2022. As you can see here, education, culture, manpower development has consistently received the largest share, though this has been decreasing through time. So this is the share of education, culture, and manpower development. It has been decreasing through time, but it's still the largest. And education sector has consistently been receiving the largest, as is mandated by the Constitution. Okay, now in 2022, the dip in its share of, uh, from 46.7% to 48.1% is to accommodate the increased allocations to social security and labor welfare subsector and to the subsidy to local government units to 19.8%. So here you see um, the broken line here below is what um, represents the social security and labor welfare. So it's it's picking up and this is because largely we'll see later that there was a huge increase in the allocation for four piece the four piece program for social protection um at the same time you can see uh the subsidy to lgus is the solid line here um just below and it's also picking up uh just below the share of uh social security and labor welfare now health will also receive a 14.1 percent increase in its budget now for economic services distribution, we can see here that communication, roads, and transportation have consistently received the largest share of economic services. Well, this is post-1990, or perhaps after 1994 or 93. So, so here, this is communication on top. Now there are proposed budgetary or nominal budgetary increases for the agri, agrarian reform, and natural resource, um, trade and industry subsectors, as well as tourism and communication and roads and transportation. So these are the subsectors. They will receive nominal increases, though their shares will um, be sort of con contracting just to give way to the increase in um, the subsidy to LGUs, as you can see here. So this is the subsidy to LGUs. So it's sort of you know squeezing out a bit uh, in terms of shares. Now, in terms of the top 10 national government departments or agencies, uh, with regards to the proposed budget. Here, let me um, mention that we look first at the individual departments and agencies in and rank them in terms of their budgetary allocation. Okay, so if it's just the individual department budgets that we're looking at, DPWH gets the highest, uh, the largest amount, um, that ad follows, and then does the ILG. Okay, so this is just for the individual department budgets. But if you look to the proposed consolidated budget, let's say for education, as is mandated in the constitution that the largest share of the budget should go to education purposes. If you see the summary of the president's budget man, uh, budget message, the DepEd, SOOCs, and TESDA and SHED would receive the largest. So they would rank number one if you if you want to aggregate it by that amount. So totaling about 77, 773 billion for, for all for these four agencies. Okay. Now on managing and uh, the COVID pandemic, both for health and for social protection expenditures too, to help assist those who, the poor and vulnerable who were affected both physically and economically by the, the pandemic. Now, one of the main three pillars of the 2022 national budget, uh, proposed national budget is building resilience amidst the pandemic. So the DH has a total proposed budget of 157.5, which represents a 16% increase. As you can see, it's been on the uptrend. Now, major programs related to the COVID response include allocation of drugs, medicines, and vaccines, health facilities enhancement programs, and the prevention on control of communicable diseases. Okay, but other COVID-specific programs include COVID laboratory network commodities, as well as human resources for emergency hiring. 
Now, for social protection expenditures, a health and social protection expenditures, still on health, no? So let's take a look at the field health. The budgetary support for field health spikes in 2022 to 79.9 billion. And this would be for the contributions of indigents, senior citizens, persons with disabilities, and financially incapable at point of service um, individuals, as well as Pamana beneficiaries of 61 million. So these are the ones affected by in conflict afflicted areas. Okay. Now for social protection, which is another aspect of the NEPS COVID-19 management. Here we present the, the, the proposed budgets for social welfare programs. So there are social welfare programs which go beyond um, DSWD. So there's also one school-based feeding program under the Department of Education, and it's included in this. And the PIDS also has a recently published for this year research paper series, also a, a public expenditure review of social protection in the Philippines. So here we can see the forerunner on top is actually the four piece program. So in the 191.2 billion allotted for the DSWD, the largest share is allocated to four piece. So um, this shows uh, what I mentioned earlier, explaining that um, the social welfare and labor, uh, social sec sector and labor welfare um, subsector of social services actually squeezed out some of the, the other subsectors in social services to accommodate for these increases in um, social protection programs. Now on to the implementation of the Mandanas ruling. So this graph shows you the uh, assistance to local government units um, special purpose fund. So it's called ALGU. And it has historically received an average of 0.018% of the budget per year since 2008. Now the 2022 budget uh, for ALGU overall has an additional 271.77 billion which is equal to about 0.02% of the total budget. Now, part and parcel of this, the largest part of it would be the intergovernmental fiscal transfer, which is called the internal revenue allotment. Okay, oh, it's now to be known the national tax allotment or the NATA. Okay, so for this year, uh, the NATA will settle at 959 billion, which is about 20% of the 5.024 trillion budget proposed, and which is about 4% of GDP. Um, there was a 38% increase of about 263.5 billion from the 2021 era. And this is because of the what I mentioned earlier, the broadened base on which to compute the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Now, before I go to the next slide, just a bit of a brief history. One of the one of the options envisioned um, in earlier years up leading leading up to this implementation of the Mandana Supreme Court ruling was actually um, deciding how to allow for um, increased transfers to local governments, but without you know decreasing fiscal space. So the idea before one of the suggestions was to reduce the amount of um, national government, local government unit assistance programs um, in order to be able to accommodate the increases. Now, if you recall also earlier, the national budget call I mentioned had a directive to refrain from proposing programs for richer LGUs However, when we examined the, the budget, we found that there are still some general LGU assistance programs present. A total of about 57 billion of the 119.86 billion proposed um, national government LGU assistance programs. Um, this is not to say that all of this um, it goes against that, but um, for example, the DA, it's explicit in their special provisions that this amount uh, for the small scale irrigation and farm to market road should go to the poorer municipal, uh, poor, poorer LGUs. And the same thing for the, the, I will be discussing the growth equity fund later. It goes to the LGUs. But, but for the DPWH programs, at least the basic infrastructure programs, it's still silent. It's still for the general LGUs. Um, and though there was a huge increase, decrease rather, from 117 billion in 2021, it is now proposed by the president's budget to be about 39.6 billion in 2022. Though I saw the house version of the third reading, this goes up by 27% to be about 50 billion. Now, another innovation uh, in the 2022 budget with regards to the Mandana's ruling would be the growth equity fund, which is envisioned to be this, the fiscal equalization fund and which is served as the main NG support to the extremely poor and disadvantaged LGUs. So this is proposed to address issues on marginalization, unequal development, 
high poverty incidence and disparities in the net fiscal capacities of LGUs. Okay, so the president's budget proposed this to be about 10 billion to cover the funding requirements of programs, projects, and activities of poor, disadvantaged, and lagging LGUs to gradually enable the full and efficient implementation of the functions and services de uh, devolved to them. But if I, the, when I checked the House version again, it was this was decreased to four billion of the Growth Equity Fund. Now, um, the Growth Equity Fund also is proposed to be time bound and performance based, and shall be provided to the LGUs for a fixed time frame. Now, one other innovation in the proposed budget that was introduced last year, but which I also would like to highlight here, because moving forward, this is also the direction we need to go. Um, institutional innovations, particularly streamlining and digitalization in government. So the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, forced us to find different ways to provide um, goods and services at the government level, especially in terms of, let's say, providing social protection assistance, such as the SAP, the Social Amelioration Program. There were some that engaged with um, financial service providers to be able to make it easier to deliver the assistance to, to those who need it at the soonest possible time. And there was this um, introduction in, in last year's budget called the Medium Term Information and Communications Technology Harmonization Initiative, or the METI Initiative, which I'd like to highlight here. So the majority goes to the DICT OSEC, okay, for, uh, you know, an investment in ICT infrastructure, but also a part of it goes to the PhilSys, the PSA, 4.8 billion of it for the PhilSys, the national ID, because one of the initial delays, uh, reason for the delays in the distribution of the first tranche of the SAP before was because there was a lack of integrated information systems on those who were poor and vulnerable. So, so hopefully, you know, fast tracking the PhilSys will help address this. Um, now, 574 million of this is addressed also, is um, allocated for community-based statistics, especially for the poorer municipalities, the fifth and sixth class municipalities. Um, and also it's explicit in the budget that the, uh, they propose that there's a need for digital technology, the pursuit of swift, swift administration of justice. So this is just an aspect of the budget that should also be highlighted and it should also be continued by the next administration. Now, let me go on to the general findings. Um, the president's budget overall, social services gets the largest share of the proposed budget, with education receiving the largest proportion. However, the decline in its 2021 share is to accommodate social security and labor welfare and subsidy to LGUs consistent with the um, national budget call. Economic services shares dip slightly from 2021, with only the share of subsidy to LGUs increasing by 15.9%. So we can see that, you know, um, the share of subsidies to LGUs sort of crowds out the other subsectors in the economic services. Now, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic management, uh, we saw that DOH and PhilHealth both received increased budgetary allocations. And uh, for social protection, the spikes in the proposed uh, budget of social assistance program went primarily to, is, well, will go primarily to 40s if it's passed. Okay, this is also consistent with the national budget call. Now, for the Mandanus ruling, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the national tax allotment increased to 200 uh, by 38% to settle at uh, 959 billion uh, in the budget. Now, what budgetary adjustments happen? Well, major assistance programs are still present, although some are redefined to be exclusively for the fifth, the poorer municipalities, um, but it decreased, the total amount decreased only by 18% compared to last year's budget, owing largely to the reduction of the DPWH's uh, basic infrastructure program. The Growth Equity Fund replaced LGSFAM for provinces, cities, and municipalities, and is, is envisioned to, to provide assistance only to the poorer or more disadvantaged um, local governments. Now, these programs must be closely monitored along with, um, and must also be implemented along with capacity building programs. Now, with respect to the institutional shifts, METHI is a convergence program. Uh, and we have to take advantage of digitalization in the, the delivery of public goods and services. And there was also priority spending on the national ID and the implementation of the CBMS for the poor LGUs. These are needed for more efficient delivery of social assistance and, uh, and to improve targeting as well. Now, what are the recommendations? Closely monitor and calibrate the extent and need for social protection and other investments in human capital. As the economy opens up with increased vaccination rates, the hope is unemployment and underemployment rates should decline. So these should be closely monitored. 
For local governments, the GEF, or Growth Equity Fund Implementation, along with other national government, local government assistance programs, should be closely monitored to ensure that only the targeted LGUs benefit from these technical capacity development programs in or to effectively use the additional resources and allow them to contribute to national development as well as are needed. Now, there should be continued investments in information, ICT infrastructure to facilitate its utilization across the different sectors, especially since these would make the delivery of public services quicker and also in the case of education and help health reduce the scarring effect. Now, the challenge of the next administration would be fiscal consolidation, tapering of the debt to GDP ratio, without sacrificing much needed human and infrastructure capital investments. These should be combined with job creation for economic recovery. Therefore, there is need for prudent fiscal stimulus in the medium term to be able to accelerate economic growth. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Justine, for your uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. So, um, friends, let's continue the conversation, and this time we will hear from our invited experts, their comments and insights. Um, as what we've seen in Justin's presentation, uh, the national tax allot allotment for the LGUs in 2022 is much higher than in 2021, precisely uh, owing to the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Ma Mandanas Garcia uh, petition. She also uh, mentioned the ruling's consequence on some of the general um, LGU assistance programs and the implementation of the Growth Equity Fund. Well, we've asked our first discussant to comment on all of these, as well as um, give us an update on the devolution transition plans and the capacity building measures that um, her department uh, is carrying out or has carried out to prepare the LGUs for the transition. We are very honored to have with us once again the Director of the Bureau of Local Government Development or DLGD of the Department of the Interior and Local uh, Government. She supervises several programs to enhance capacities of local government for greater autonomy to pursue local economic development and to encourage good performance through a performance incentive program. She is also the head secretariat of the DILG Transition Management Committee, created to mobilize efforts of uh, the DILG in preparing for and in facilitating LG transition to full devolution in line with the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Mandanas Garcia petitions in 2022. She leads the implementation of uh, Different projects supported by the UNDP, the ADB, World Bank, GIZ, UNICEF, and AUSAID, such as the Southeast Asia Public Management, uh, Financial Sector and Trade uh, Policy Facility, Planning for Greater Resiliency and Recovery and Rehabilitation. She holds a bachelor's degree in statistics and a master's degree in public administration, major in local and regional government from the University of the Philippines. Friends, I now give you Director Annalisa Bonagua. Director Anna, the floor is now yours. Maraming salamat, Sheila. Uh, maraming salamat. Thank you for inviting the ILG to share our insights on the study uh, analysis of the 2022 President's Budget. And at the onset, let me say that uh, DILG really acknowledges the work of PIDS in this paper, which provides an overall perspective of the 20 2022 budget, proposed budget, and examines how uh, the National Expenditure Program, FY 2022 Expenditure Program, embodies the priorities identified by national government to recover from the adverse effect of pandemic and uh, the shift, no? the anticipated shift in local governance in light of the Supreme Court ruling implementation by, by next year, which is two months to go. Um, the DILG supports this kind of initiative as this definitely helps uh, people understand clearly the priorities of government and also will give more meaning to the Philippines ranking or the Philippines ranking first in Southeast Asia and 10 uh, worldwide for budget transparency. 
So let me proceed. No, I'll be uh, more or less focusing more on the concerns uh, for local government units. As reported by uh, Director Justin, uh, in line with this, uh, with the priorities of the government, social services uh, gets uh, the largest share, which is at thirty-eight point three percent, with education getting the the biggest share, along with uh, providing social welfare and. Uh, social welfare and social protection, labor protection or labor welfare to, to the people, which somehow uh, take a little from uh, the share for economic services, but still get substantially, substantial allocation at 29.4%. These two sectors alone, you know, the social services and economic sector, comprise already 67.6% .6 of the total national expenditure uh, program, which is almost almost uh, two thirds of the national expend or more than two thirds of the national expenditure program, which I think what is the people, what the people want uh, to see and who has been hoping for. The remaining thirty two point four percent is being shared among general services, debt servicing, and defense and the defense sector. So maliit na lang, and uh, by. Uh, 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 under the NEP, by 2022, the LGUs will be uh, given a greater share, considering that they will be uh, playing a greater role in carrying out uh, the implementation of the social and the services sector allocation for social services and economic services as a result of the enhanced decentralization following the Mandanas ruling. In view of the increase in the national tax allotment, as reported by uh, Dr. Justin, by around 263.5 uh, billion or around 38% increase from the FY 2020 for, from the current budget. Now, the total allocation for local government units or the ALGO will increase by 22% of the total net, no? which is the highest, I think the highest allocation for local government units uh, in the history of our local governments. Uh, with more financial resources uh, going to the LGUs, the national government identified spending responsibilities on the devolved mandates to be carried out primarily by local government units, secondary lang and support ang national government. So this new phase of devolution or decentralization provides prospect for improved service delivery, as experts uh, would say, and subscribing to the subsidiary principle, local governments are in the ground, on the ground and can directly fill the citizens' needs and aspiration. And hence, uh, decentralization encourages prompt responses and better matching of government services to local needs, making governance more inclusive. Um, this is also especially true if citizens have uh, effective channels through which they can voice uh, or their voices can be heard to enhance accountability. However, uh, there's a need to look at the capacities of local government units to absorb the red default functions while maintaining their full autonomy in planning and managing this, these resources. No? There might be a risk of uh, that the transition process could lead to a gap in service delivery if there will not be close coordination between national and local governments during the devolution transition period and if there will be uh, uh, no updating and fine-tuning of the implementation capacities of local government. The national government uh, through the national budget circular which has been the basis also for uh, the NEP and has been laid down in the NEP, defined the expenditure responsibilities clearly by uh, both national agencies and local government units. No? Therefore, uh, there will be urgent need to provide capacity building to support local governments to improve their implementation capacities along the identified uh, uh, devolved mandated or devolved mandates to local government units or shall we call red devolved and provide guidance to enjoin local government units to channel the increased resources uh, towards government's uh, priority, particularly uh, government's uh, campaign in responding to COVID-19 to mitigate budget execution risks while providing the much needed support uh, to the local constituents. 
And likewise, no, hindi dapat makalimutan that the national government have to define the standards and put in place the necessary monitoring and assessment mechanism on the level of effectiveness, yung expected level of effectiveness and citizen satisfaction on the LG service delivery so that therefore national government can, can at least uh, guide LGUs to expect the same level of service delivery as has been provided by the national government or uh, comparable services across uh, local government units within the same level across provinces, across cities, and across municipalities. Uh, moving on to the uh, the, the GEF, no, included as a counterpart or as a component of the ALGU, no, in addition to the the era which comprised, as mentioned by the uh, Dr. Jo Dr. Justin, uh, comprising around eighty six percent. So the other components of those are the other uh, transfers or assistance to local government units, which under the uh, twenty twenty two NEP is a Pro, uh, proposal for a growth equity fund, which uh, replaces the various LGSF uh, that we pre previously have in the previous three years for provinces, cities, and municipalities. And uh, the GF is primarily designed to address the unequal fiscal capacities of local government units. Now, we all know that while the local government code mandates similar list of functions uh, within the same level of local government units, no, the same list of functions for all municipalities, all provinces, all cities, and even barangays, regardless of their capacities and development level. So the proposed uh, allocation for GEF, uh, which we think is still significantly small, no, is an acknowledgement of the current realities and concerns on marginalization, unequal development, high poverty incidents, and disparities in the net net fiscal capacities of local governments, given the diversity in resources, capacities, and situations of LGUs across the country. Uh, it has been designed as, uh, to cater to poor disadvantage and development challenge local government units so that they can cope up no, para makahabol sila dun sa mga more advanced local government units. Um, in relation to the institutional shift, no, it is a welcome development for the ILG and especially for our local government units to see priority uh, uh, spending on the national ID and the implementation of the community-based monitoring system or CBMS. Even while this allocation for our, for the national government, this will provide accurate information, not just for national government, but most especially for local government units uh, to aid them in their local planning, budgeting, beneficiary targeting, uh, for more efficient uh, delivery of social services, including social secur security and welfare programs by local government units. Um, and also, uh, well, um, we would just like to, as we have always been see, saying in, 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 the, in the many con consultation conferences with local government units, while the share of local government units or uh, the, the, the proposed allocation in the NEP by 2022 will increase, no, allocation or shares of local government units uh, is projected to decrease by 2023 and 2024. And that, that will be also included in the, in the NEP in, the, in, the, in those years. Uh, nominally, because of the decrease in the collection of the national government in view of the impact or uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic to the macroeconomic uh, situation of the country. The consequent decrease in revenue collection will in effect uh, decrease the resources as uh, part of the pie or the, or the pie for the national both local government as will be in the net for 2023 and 2024 will become smaller. Uh, moreover, uh, COVID-19 also affected local economies, uh, thereby decreasing locally generated revenues at it as, and it also put pressures uh, uh, or put pressure on local government units uh, financial resource given the need for LGs to prioritize strengthening of emergency and response activities. Uh, tuloy -tuloy 2022. And this is precisely why DILG have required local government units to formulate local revenue forecast 
and revenue mobilization strategy as an integral requirement of the devolution transition plans for them to be able to proactively plan out measures uh, that can mitigate the impact of the decrease or in the national tax allotment in the said years by improving their local revenue collection strategies. Um, furthermore, uh, there's a need to strengthen collaboration between national and local government agencies and local government units you know, in crafting uh, sound, unified, harmonized policies and interventions, as well as ensuring cooperation and compliance of local governments. We need to ensure a substantive budget allocation that well, the, the substantive budget allocation remaining at the national government agency will also shift from direct service delivery uh, as they've been carrying out on the devolved functions, or devolved mandates, or and on subsidies for LGUs to providing guidance and capacity building and monitoring performance of local government units. So the remaining uh, significant allocation for the national government will have to be shift. No, uh, as mentioned by Director Justin, that he, he mentioned that there is a significant allocation for programs uh, that are supposed to be for devolved services. But what we're seeing here that this allocation should be shifted to supporting uh, very low income local government units or low capacity local government units, as well as in um, providing capacity building for all levels of local government units so that they will be all in one direction and aligned in, su in supporting the national priorities while addressing unique needs in, of their constituents. And lastly, there's also a need to focus uh, part of the budget of the NGA to maximize engagement with civil society organization and other governance partners, and also to strengthen citizen citizens capacity to demand accountability through measures like citizen participation in budgeting, expenditure uh, processes, public hearings on budget information, civil uh, civic monitoring of intergovernmental transfer and monitoring of local service provision and other social audits uh, processes. The citizen represented by the civil society organization can serve us, can we, we can maximize their roles as gabay, kaagapay, and bantay at the local level, thereby espousing greater participation, transparency, and accountability of local government units, uh, uh, powers, responsibilities, so that more uh, resources and the responsibilities for of the more uh, resources given them. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, I have some updates if you need, but I think it will be asked in the question and answer. Updates on the DTP, so I'll stop there, Ms. Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bonagua. Yes, we can. Uh, you can continue your your uh, updates, ma'am. You can give us the updates on the devolution transition plans during the open forum, because for sure, um, we have participants who are also uh, interested to know about uh, the DTPs. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. It's always a pleasure to um, have you at our uh, webinar. Okay, uh, friends, we also invited an international uh, public finance expert uh, to share with us his comments on the study's uh, findings and recommendations, and also uh, his insights on how the government could be more strategic in its spending and uh, perhaps how it could it. Uh, could exercise uh, fiscal prudence given the country's uh, ballooning debt. Okay, so please help me welcome Mr. Um, Fabian Seder, lead public sector specialist at the World Bank. Ms. Seder, Mr. Seder is based in Thailand and has worked for over 20 years on fiscal and public financial management related analytics and reforms in East Asia, South Asia, and Middle East and North Africa. He has led a governance program in the Maghreb region, and he has mainly worked in middle-income countries on public finance and investment management at the central and subnational level, as well as on state-owned enterprise, enterprise reforms. He was based in Manila from uh, 2003 to 2005. Um, thus, he is familiar with uh, uh, 
is familiar with uh, what's happening in the Philippines uh, and uh, our um, economic landscape here. He is an economist and holds two master's degrees from the University of uh, Bonn and University of Nantes and Paris Sorbonne. He is a member of the World Bank Global Solutions Group on Public Financial Management and State-Owned Enterprises and a facilitator for the Treasury Community of Practice of Asia. Mr. Sederer, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much for, for your introduction and thank you very much for this uh, invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be with you. I am indeed uh, missing the Philippines a lot. Uh, it's been a long time I haven't been able to travel due to the COVID restrictions. I really want to also thank uh, Dr. Diokno Sikat for this excellent and insightful analysis and presentation and Director Bonagua for this very interesting update on the Redevolution Plan. This is indeed a major reform. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks short. I'll focus on three points, fiscal consolidation, fiscal decentralization, and fiscal management uh, information systems. Um, so in terms of fiscal consolidation, basically the idea is really to look at fiscal cons consolidation that supports the post-COVID recovery and ensures fiscal sustainability. And that's based on the analysis of the bank's economic team because COVID indeed has disrupted public finances and fiscal balances across the world. And the Philippines is no exception. I mean, one difference is maybe that the government was very proactive in its fiscal response to alleviate the economic and social impact of the pandemic. And this was possible thanks to the fiscal buffers built up in previous years. Thus the need to rebuild these fiscal buffers. As Justine, Justine's presentation shows, this response has, and the crisis has really led to significant fiscal deficit, which increased to 9% GDP in 2021. And also an important increase in government debt from 40 to 60% by mid this year. There's obviously a both a numerator and a denominator effect, which requires a prudent and gradual fiscal consolidation, balancing growth recovery and also fiscal sustainability. This seems to be the government's plan with a gradual reduction of fiscal deficits to 7.5% in 2022, and then a further reduction to 5.3% GDP in 2024. So while this is still above the pre-COVID deficit targets around 3%, it will allow to maintain significant infrastructure investments up to 5% GDP, thereby supporting growth and competitiveness. The challenge of this plan is that it spans two administrations. And indeed, in any fiscal consolidation plan, the key question is really the timing and the length of this fiscal consolidation. It needs to be aligned both with the economic and the political cycles. Initiating the fiscal consolidation when the economy starts to recover, and also at the beginning of a new administration when the political capital is highest. Also offering it, it the opportunity to create fiscal space to deliver on its program. However, in the current high level of uncertainty, the waves of COVID, new variants coming up every time, every time it's quite difficult uh, to predict, to get the timing and the length right. And so this will really require flexibility in the response. And it will also require timely and, and detailed data on, on the fiscal allocations, the execution of the budget and systems to be able to have this data. And I'll come to that in my third point. The next question is what type of fiscal consolidation and finding the right balance between revenue and expenditure measures, which are supporting growth while reducing poverty and inequality, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic and public health measures. So what measures on the revenue side can be considered? So typically tax administration reforms to improve collection voluntary compliance are the most neutral and progressive. They may not yield as much revenue as fiscal policy, tax policy measures, but they yield a constant revenue stream. And I think there are a few very interesting initiatives in that regard. The ease of paying tax bill, for instance, and the BIR digital transformation plan are excellent measures in that respect, which need to be expedited to yield additional revenue when they're most needed. Now, this also will require, I guess, a simplification of processes, business process engineering and change management to make sure the reforms stick and deliver. The customization project is also another opportunity to increase revenues. The digital economy tax 
is another simple, profitable and progressive tax that could be expedited as it's being done across the world and in the region. And the House has already approved the bill, which is good news. On the expenditure side, the proposed focus on capital infrastructure to support economic recovery and competitiveness is welcome. However, to deliver these increase in capital expenditures and get the expected benefits will require the strengthening of public investment management, improvement of capital budget execution, a strong and ready project portfolio that maximizes the efficiency gains. And a recent IMF World Bank study on public investment management has shown that there is a substantial potential efficiency gains to be reaped up, estimated to 23%. And I think that's particularly true at the sub-national level, where the capacity in capital budget execution is the lowest. A World Bank study last year showed that uh, the average capital budget execution was only 50%. And I'll go, come back to that uh, in the next point, which is on fiscal decentralization post mandamus ruling. The challenges and opportunity for redevolution and equity. This is indeed a major reform as we see in the budget uh, reallocations. This uh, significant increase in IRA allocations by 38% or two, 263 billion pesos is really massive. And the budget, the 2022 budget also entails cuts in allocations to national government agencies programs to LGUs in order to mitigate the fiscal impact of the mandamus ruling in a fiscally constrained environment, but also avoid double dipping. However, what I saw from the analysis presented is that the cuts at the national level are not as abrupt as expected. I noted only a cut of 63 billion for LGU programs, which compared to the 263 billion increases is actually not so much. There may also be some reallocations between national programs which still benefit LGUs and notably in the public works department. The agency's devolution transition plan are supposed to specify the functions, the funds and the personnel, the staff to be devolved to what level of LGUs as mentioned by Director Bonagua. And this is a very complex process which requires detailed costing of the functions of the programs and projects to be transferred in order to ensure appropriate funding and avoid the disruptions uh, which she mentioned. It's good to see that the Executive Order 138 foresees a three-year transition plan and mandates national agencies and local governments on for the development of these devolution transition plans. And I'll also be very interested to hear in the in the next session on where that stands. From what we have seen so far, that's still work in progress. Not surprisingly, it's it's a huge task. Uh, and there's a risk actually of a likely mismatch between the, 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 the functions and programs devolved and the resources, as the cost of these uh, functions and programs does not inform the level of additional resources received by LGUs, which is based on the Mandanus rule. And so therefore, there's, this is likely to exacerbate the vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalances in the absence of a revision of the fiscal transfer and equalization rules. So this also raises an equity concern at a critical time when COVID has exacerbated poverty and inequality. We would just recommend the revision of the fiscal transfer and equalization rule. And there has been a lot of research and discussion on that. And hopefully that's something the next administration can take on. In the meantime, these imbalances and equity concerns can be partially addressed through a phased and differentiated re-evolution and through the new growth and equity fund Director Bonagua mentioned and which was introduced in the 2022 budget. I understand from this analysis does, that this seems to be the case uh, and the direction the government is taking because uh, poorest LGUs seem to be spared from the budget cuts and the reallocations uh, in this budget and also the, the GEF is targeted as the poorest and lagging region, as just mentioned. It would be important to look maybe at how this fund functions, how it's dispersing, to whom and to what projects. It's the first year, it's a consolidation of past programs. We're trying to see how maybe it can be strengthened, simplified in the future. And also trying to see how 
seize the opportunity to include performance and accountability criteria and incentives to ensure that these additional resources are spent well and in a transparent manner, building on the AIG's seal of good governance and other performance monitoring initiatives, which are very welcome. This raises also another challenge of the limited absorption capacity of many AGUs, particularly in terms of capital expenditure, which I, which I mentioned earlier. So the share of capital expenditure is quite high, 25%, and the largest reallocation in the 2022 budget, as projects are being devolved to LGUs um, and supposed to be financed through their increased uh, ARA allocations. But this is likely to exacerbate the already low capital budget execution, which we have seen, and stretch the thin capacity in that respect. So it's great to see that there's uh, specific initiatives to build capacity of LGUs. And it will be interesting to see to what extent these focus ought to be on strengthening public investment management, supporting LGUs at the provincial, at the regional level, through specific public investment task force that brings together the expertise um, and the different skill sets that are needed to build a strong and ready pipeline of projects and deliver this to deliver the development which is foreseen. And so it would be good to see to what extent the Executive Order 138 uh, program on technical assistance can be designed in that respect and supported by partners. My third and last point has to do with fiscal management and the budget execution through digital transformation and the integrated financial management information systems. And I was very pleased to see in the, the presentation that digital transformation is a government priority which is also reflected in the budget. However, it's concerning to see that departments such as DBM have a very limited allocation for that. I think I noted 0.4 billion, billion, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is very little given the urgent need of an integrated financial management information system, which is really the heart of digital transformation of public financial management. Was it budget considerations that led to the suspension this year of the budget and treasury management system, despite the important investments already made in technology and licenses and rollout? BTMS is really the core of an IFMIS, an integrated automated system that helps digitize public financial management processes, including budget formulation, budget execution, but also commitment controls, cash management and treasury as well as increase, improving financial uh, reporting and accounting. And so an IFMIS is really essential. And we've seen across the world, most countries, and particularly middle-income countries, have such an integrated financial management information system now in place or acquiring them. And in the region, there's only Myanmar now, which, which hasn't uh, won and is not acquiring one. And such an IFMIS and BTMS is really essential for a few reasons, which I'll quickly mention. One, for the effective management of the government's macrofiscal aggregates, which are important to ensure fiscal discipline and sustainability in times of crisis, but also allowing for reallocations by having timely, comprehensive and consistent data on budget execution. So it really helps reallocate the spending where it's much needed. Um, it helps also align the, the, the allocation with the actuals, so complement the uh, today's analysis on the allocation with an analysis on the actual spending on the different programs, but also at, at, uh, at the local level, hopefully soon. It's, very, it's important also to improve the timeliness and cost efficiency of public spending because these systems are usually transactional. You route your financial transactions for that. It enables you to go paperless, to have much faster budget execution and electronic processing of more than 4 million financial transactions a year. It also helps you the digital commitment control, so much more efficient controls, making sure that there aren't commitments which are not backed by the necessary resources and therefore reducing the risk of arrears, uh, which impacts negatively a private sector already struggling uh, these days. It also improves cash management and brings huge savings to the government in this fiscally constrained situation. It enables the direct electronic fund transfer to citizens, companies and vendors and therefore reducing transaction cost on their side, as well as for the government. And finally, it also helps 
LG budget execution and oversight. And I'm sure that the LG would be very pleased to see a BTMS rolled out to local governments uh, to be able to have a much more uh, comprehensive, granular, and timely access to financial data. So we therefore really highly recommend the resumption of the BTMS rollout and to build on it to develop a full FMIS, which the Philippines needs and deserves, which can serve both the national agencies and the LGUs, while obviously building the capacity for the national level to maintain the system and make it sustainable. So this would be my three points. Thank you very much. I'm happy to join the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Fabian uh, Sederer. We are uh, very pleased to hear your thoughts on uh, the three aspects of um, uh, fiscal uh, consolidation, uh, fiscal decentralization, and, and fiscal uh, management. Uh, actually, as, as I was listening to you, um, I noticed that your thoughts on uh, fiscal decentralization closely ties with the uh, closely ties up with, uh, with the thoughts also. Uh, shared with us earlier by uh, director Managua, particularly on the need to uh, the need for um, uh, capacity building of our um, lgus to prepare them for the transition okay so friends um, we still have one more expert um who will share with us um will share with us his uh, uh insights and uh, we are honored to have with us I think for the first time in our public webinar series, Dr. Alvin Am, who is a professor at the Department of Economics of the Ateneo de Manila University and an adjunct lecturer at the Ateneo School of Government. He was the director of the Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development from uh, 2016 to 2021. And uh, actually, he is a, a, a well, um, a most sought uh, guest resource person on economic and policy matters on radio and television, both in the Philippines and uh, and abroad. No, he is the co-grand prize winner of the 2011 Outstanding Research for Development of the develop of the Global Development Awards and fellow at the Institute for Money, Technology, and Finance Institute. Um, at the University of California at Irvine, Professor. Um, he earned his uh, PhD in Applied Economics at Osaka University in 2006 and his Master in Public Policy from the National University of Singapore in 1999. Friends, please help me in welcoming uh, uh, Professor Alvin Ang. Sir, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Justin, for your presentation. Uh, we had very good insights also coming from Director Anna and uh, Fabian. Thank you for your inputs. Um, my take here is uh, not anymore going to be on the local governments at much broader, looking at a much uh, broader uh, perspective, looking at how, uh, how this budget will really help us through this pandemic. Uh, as we all know, uh, the surprising third quarter growth Full year growth now uh, is, you know, the economy is getting better, but uh, we are still about 5% off the main road, so to speak. So we still need to just get back the 2019 levels and then get back to, to growth. However, uh, that's not the only, uh, that's not the only thing that is, uh, uh, we are facing right now, not just the growth per se, but we need to look at uh, three things uh, because uh, as we say, there is a new normal that we are facing. So the budget that has been prepared, uh, I think uh, just like what Justin was uh, analyzing uh, in her paper, is that essentially you, st you, st you you're, is, is it just simply a transfer of resource uh, of what you have distributing the pie? And she was saying, you know, social services gets the big chunk, which is, which is important because we are still in a pandemic. And then and then economic services but really you really what we really need moving forward is an is a budget that takes into consideration adaptation uh, processes so i'm i'm going to talk about three things here first is that uh, the budget should be looking for adaptation not avoiding covid so we we have all of the uh, resources being put to help but what about the adaptation processes 
uh, that uh, we are facing, essentially uh, looking at the trends. Digitalization is there, but it cannot be a, a, um, a slap on the hand kind of investment in digitalization. For one, uh, we have had the broadband, national broadband project uh, since 2008 on the plate, but never get to be fully implemented. We really need a a widespread digitalization or interconnectivity much broader and bigger than uh, the physical infrastructure because of the change environment of way of, of the way of doing things so ba basically what what happens uh, even after the pandemic is that we are going to be in a blended kind of a work and study environment so that requires very strong uh, internet connectivity very 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 good digital governance uh, which i think the budget is focusing slightly uh, mostly only on on putting it uh, in small places but you really need a whole uh, systems uh, uh, to bring that in, into into practice the second element in the adaptation component is basically looking at uh, uh, the active labor market uh, so we have social protection programs but most of them are focused on uh, uh, institutional requirements such as the four P's and many of the laws that have been passed that needs to be funded. But you really need to look at the, the social insurance uh, or, or the unemployment insurance because the pandemic is, is, has caused and will cause more uh, job uh, destruct, destruction uh, as digitalization progresses. So many of these jobs that have been lost, most likely they will not be uh, coming back, particularly in, in sectors where people have already adopted to digitalization. So that will also be the case in the Philippines. And also, uh, we have to prepare for the long haul uh, in, in, in this active labor market policies, which means that there should be not just uh, test that kind of training, but, you know, more specific kind of intervention to address uh, potential unemployment and underemployment. Uh, the second element, and I think uh, Fabian uh, more or less uh, said something about this as well, is that um, mo you know every year we have very good budget proposals coming from the national government. Uh, the challenge essentially is the utilization of this budget, the absorptive capacity. I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, push it at the local level, but you know, look at the national level, how much of, of the budget are utilized by the major agencies such as DPWH, DOTR. Uh, in, in past uh, COA reports, you, have, you will see, or even DBM analysis, you will see that, uh, that almost at the end of the year, they are they still have more than uh, a substantial amount, about 40% unspent. So th there is a challenge there that, you know, we cannot keep on asking for new resources if we cannot spend it properly or, or focus uh, its use. You know? So we, are, we could not be catching up all the time. So I think that this is an important element, the capacity uh, utilization of the, of the budget. I think uh, if there's an opportunity, there's, this should be good to analyze what what are the challenges uh, that continues to hound, uh, particularly capital outlays uh, in 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 utilizing the budget. As we all know, even the Bayanihan one and two uh, were not fully utilized at certain ex, ex, uh, to a certain point because of this. I I believe capacity utilization, which in turn can be interrelatedly. Uh, uh, solved by by digitalization um, so it's it's a question that uh, we are we are targeting this much if we don't know how much is utilized well then you know the the program of of uh, financing particularly the debt component if you're going to borrow and then we're not going to use it properly uh, that's going to be a big challenge because it, I, I mean uh, there is a big debt that we're facing right now, but you know the, the Philippines is not the only country that borrowed. Everyone borrowed. All over, all countries, almost all countries in the world borrowed. The Philippines did not. Uh, actually, there's still room for us to borrow externally, but we don't need to use that unless um, we really are executing correctly 
the the budget for creating economic activities uh you know to to pump prime the economy basically so so to me the debt is that an issue as long as we outgrow it as long as the economy grows uh in the past the, the debt has remained basically uh, the same because we were just paying basically the interest, but the economy has been growing and growing such that we have been outgrowing the debt for the last uh, 20 years, except of course during this pandemic. Uh, so it it is it is not the increase basically of the expenditures, but the use of the expenditures that matters. So the second point there is about really about utilization of the budget. And finally, um, the, the budget, uh, I, I also look at the details of it. it. You know, it's very difficult to go into all the details per agency, but I am. I think there is some elements that we need to look at in relation to rationalizing the economic participation of government. For example, uh, related to what I'm saying about these global trends that are, are we are seeing right now. For instance, the the supply bottleneck happening around the world. Uh, particularly uh, in shipping, it's causing uh, global value chain and disruptions. So it could, you know, for countries uh, uh, to think of moving back their resources or their investment to their home country. So, you know, th the volatility of the global value chain structure is very real and uh, it, it could lead to, you know, moving back of, of uh, resources to, the, to their mother countries. So this is a rationalization thing. So what, what is our uh, government going to do? Uh, this is basically, uh, to a certain extent, the need to bring up the competitive advantage of, of our country. The industrial policies may need to be visited. We may, we may need to, to spend on some of this. For instance, uh, in in the business process outsourcing, particularly the higher value part, which is animation, creative, uh, digitalization, we have an advantage there, but we are not able to really fly because not much investment uh, is coming into that. So I wonder uh, moving forward, not necessarily this budget, but in coming years, how can that be uh, integrated into these processes and and finally in 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 the last point in this last point the challenge of of climate change which is which is uh have been affecting the philippines for a long time uh we only have uh quick release funds but really there is no structural uh uh an institutional effort to put it in the budget to address it and how to really make it uh, very clear up to the local government levels. So uh, th those three things, uh, adapt adaptation, utilization, the budget and rationalization uh, due to different global uh, challenges uh, had to be one way or another be into the budget, uh, not necessarily immediately, but as we build up uh, in this pandemic, this should be part of the process. So that's all, Sila. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Ang, for your um, thought-provoking uh, comments, sir. The points you underscored are indeed very important. It's not just about, you know, drawing up a budget, you know, increasing the, the allocation uh, in certain sectors, but really, uh, making sure that we use the budget properly and it goes to uh goes for the to the right um you know um programs and it's being used for the right purpose and also making sure that the government agencies and the lgus and the entities of government are also able to use it no okay so sir we'll hear more from you um uh, uh during the open forum no so Okay, we, we, friends, we have heard the analysis of Justine and the insights of our three um, expert reactors. And this time, we would like to hear from you. So we will now entertain your questions. But before that, may I inform all of you that um, 
we won't have a poll today, but we will pick uh, three names from our WebEx participants and two from Facebook who will each receive a uh, PIDS uh, notebook as our token of appreciation. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, some questions already from our uh, uh, participants and let me start with the question but before that okay perhaps we can um uh, hear a few words from uh, our presenter and the author of the study dr uh, justin sikat for his uh response to the comments of our of our discussions justine you may go ahead yes thank you sheeta and thank you so much alvin fabian and director anna for your very um insightful and how do i say it right on point uh, comments, especially for Alvin earlier. Thank you so much. Um, the points that you have mentioned, the adaptation, the absorptive capacity and utilization of the budget and the rationalization are all very important. And with regard to the absorptive capacity and budget utilization, that's actually also one of my uh, advocacies. Um, in one of our studies on local governments, this time on the local government level, we found, as Fabian mentioned earlier, there is very low um capital outlay uh, budget utilization and this is very critical moving forward and this would also help address one of the questions already i saw in the chat box with regard to a more progressive medium-term plan there needs to be strategic investment especially in terms of capital infrastructure spending we must identify what is it that really is the challenge in that for local governments one of our um the core reports suggested that local governments only spend about 70 percent of what they're mandated to spend on infrastructure spending. And the, you know, we're missing out a lot on this because there are large fiscal multipliers, which was found by a study, a journal article by Debuque Gonzalez just this year. Large fiscal multipliers when it comes to regional spending, uh, regional capital outlay spending. So we need this to, re to recover from the economy. So, so I think this, um, as well as Fabian's point on absorptive capacity is, uh, you know, are very much aligned. With respect to the digit digitalization needs and the adaptation uh, going beyond the national broadband program, I absolutely agree with you. In our APPC 2020 conference on innovating governance, this was also one of the issues we highlighted. Yes, there is the MIT convergence program, but moving forward, there needs to be a lot more investments as well. And another tool that mentioned that was mentioned earlier by Fabian when he mentioned the BTMS, or the this is the FMS or management information system. This is very crucial because this would really give real time information with regards to the implementation of of programs and projects and would help adjust. You know, if we're slacking on spending on capital outlays, identify the bottlenecks and we have to spend it immediately. So there really needs to be an understanding of why there are some delays in the utilization of the budget and to have strategic investment programming. Now, also on the if I if I can go ahead and answer as well part of the question posed by Novel. Hi, Novel. Good afternoon um, from Congress there. Yeah, um, it's important also in terms of investment programming. I think I mentioned earlier that our study on the baseline for municipalities, we found that out of 1,373 municipalities, only about 30% of them actually had updated local development investment programs. And these are actually the sources of infrastructure projects that are needed so that LGUs can also contribute to national development. The fiscal multipliers will work at the, the, the local level. So, so I think improvement in terms of capacity as well mentioned by Director Anna in how to design not just the development investment programs, but also the um, development plans of new incoming officials is very, very critical for next year. So uh, that's it for, for me. Thank you. Sheena. Thank you very much, Justine. Uh, you've, um, so you've already uh, responded to the question of uh, Director Novell because I don't see it in the chat box. I think it was a question that was directly uh, sent to you. Yeah, yeah, I don't see it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Yes. Um, okay. We now proceed to um, the um, questions of our other participants. And let me begin with the question of uh, Mr. Antonio Avila. Okay, so 
Okay, he said the article of Yusek Fermin Adriano in the September 16, 2021 issue of the Manila Times states that the budgetary support for agriculture was inadequate, equivalent to 1.6% of the national budget in 2021, especially if compared with Malaysia with 2.3%, Vietnam at 6.5%, Thailand 3.6%, Indonesia uh, 3.4%. Um, some sectors feel that to enable our economy to recover, uh, okay, to enable our recovery, our economy to recover faster, to recover faster in the next three years, the government should provide more budget for agriculture comparable to other ASEAN countries. So his uh, short question is, do you agree? I, I think, you, I think you do, Justine. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not an agriculture expert, so I really can't say with numbers. But um, I think that's a challenge when we're looking at the the budget. It's really, you know, as I said earlier, it's a common resource. So, so the priorities really identified for this particular budget really were, you know, still managing the now and well, it's now endemic COVID nineteen. So it's the the need for the adaptation, as Alvin said earlier. So. So if that's what you said for me, and also I think another colleague of ours, Roel Briones, has written a lot about this. Yes. Um, I think perhaps... I was hoping, I was, hoping, yeah. uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I was searching for um, yeah. Roel in our uh, list of participants, but unfortunately he is not around. But uh, Exactly. So, so I guess that's why I managed it in the sense that of course, we can always say that there is not enough spending for certain sectors, but however, there were just um, other um, priorities in this particular budget that were identified, particularly health, social protection, and still on infrastructure. So that's the safe answer. I'm not an expert on agriculture, so I won't yes. even attempt to, to answer that. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Professor Ang, would you like to uh, um, give your comments on this, sir? If on agriculture, yes, <laughs> I'm on not agriculture. Also, it's okay. Well, I, can, I can, I can, I can say some broad uh, things yes. about. It. I, I, well, yeah. it's, it's not a question again, uh, like Justin said. It's not a question of how much you put in the sector, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the efficient use of of the money. We have That's been right. putting money in that sector, well, almost all of this economic sector for a long time, but. Uh, the, the, you know, we don't see productivity improvement, yes. so we know that, that there is something amiss so, uh, some, at some point. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's not just putting the money, but you know, executing it right. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, I think, but it's really important that uh, the, mm -hmm. the Philippines, uh, reg, you know, get back our agricultural strength because uh, in this region we are importing our most basic uh, food items. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that cannot be at the expense of our remittances and BPOs because you know there's kind of moral hazard now being created uh, along that line. So in a way, this also helps the government, like you know, focus on just a few things. But but if the OFW remittances and the BPOs are not there, really, you know, the 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 budget would be hard pressed all the more mm -hmm. to be used efficiently. So, so in in agriculture, uh, the the LGUs have has it. It's devolved, you know. Agriculture is devolved, and uh, the most imaginative LGUs have produced good crops, good pro good good products uh, in agriculture. But again, uh, the DA also have done their part. So it, it's a question now of execution. Uh, not just not giving uh, giving more money may 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 push a little, but not really. You know the, the elasticity will be very low. No? So it's not going to double or triple the output. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Ang. Very well said. Okay. Uh, Mr. Antonio Avila has a second question, but let me jump to this because uh, this question from one of our Facebook uh, viewers, Lamel uh, Preciados, is. Uh, um related to the budget execution and us because to determine whether we are really you know um spending uh the our spending it well no and for the right purpose we have to have a good monitoring and evaluation uh program no and the question of uh lemuel is uh he's, he's curious to know how monitoring and evaluation of these expenditures are usually done 
how does our government balance the costs and benefits and trade-offs of these budget adjustments? What are key indicators of impacts and returns of these investments? And are we learning from best practices done by other countries in terms of uh, budgeting uh, framework? Okay, perhaps we can ask uh, uh, Director uh, Bonagua regarding his, his insights, ma'am, on let's say how how the DILG as an oversight agency is uh, monitoring, you know, um, um, the different LGUs, ma'am, um, especially now in the light of the Mandanas ruling, what measures have the DILG, um, um, you know, installed to ensure that there will be good uh, budget uh, execution, sir, by uh, ma'am, by the LGUs? Um, thank you, Sheila. Well, in terms of budget execution and utilization, it, it will not just be DILG as an oversight agency, but would include all other oversight agency like yes, uh, the DBM, mm -hmm. uh, DOF, and uh, probably uh, COA for that matter. Yes. Oh, okay. So there are already established uh, mechanisms on how to ensure that uh, the budget given to local government units are spent uh, efficiently and effectively. No, but I think at the end of the day, as mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Algen, uh, Dr. Ang, uh, the results should uh, give us the uh, the final the, the the final measure whether local government units are able to really. Uh, execute the budget allocated to them or the resources given them. Uh, right now, um, there are already several controls and mechanisms and monitoring tools instituted by national government agency for our, uh, as in the ILC, we have the performance monitoring of local government units, whether LCUs are doing what is mandated of them for local government code and other laws passed after the local government code. So we have the seal of good local governance for the uh, uh, DBM, they have the uh, PFM assessment tool, which measures whether LGUs are complying with the, the mechanism on proper budgeting and investment programming. And likewise, the Department of Finance, uh, Bureau of Local Government Finance, have their uh, score ng bayan or yung financial sustainability uh, index, which measures the uh, utilization of uh, the budgets of the local government units, whether they are able to spend uh, in accordance with what is provided to them and uh, fr from which they can measure uh, the spending capacity and the surpluses and even uh, the budgets that are not able to implement by local government. So there are already measures and this I think should be tightened and strengthened yes. uh, in view of the greater resources given to our local government units. And in case of monitoring of the impact of uh, the implementation of these resources, the sectoral national government agencies should be beep, beep up their uh, monitoring uh, yes. mechanism to ensure that uh, LGUs deliver the impacts per sector that are assigned to each of the sectoral agency because they know better than the other agencies. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's that's really a, a play of uh, the contribution and a play of uh, harmonization of the activities of the oversight agencies as well as the sectoral agencies in order to ensure that, that local government unit put the resources given them to proper uh, in the proper way to ensure that these are uh, giving the impact that is expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bonagua. Perhaps we can also, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to actually add something if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I remember that uh, Director Bonagua also mentioned um, in one of our conversations the other time that there's also this electronic uh, local development investment program um, initiative if I'm, and this this actually is also very critical when it comes to strategic um, investments. Uh, so to be able to monitor this, um, will this be continued, ma'am? And is this still being pursued? Thank you, Director Bonagua, ma'am. Um, yes, there, I, Dr. Jasty, you know, um, uh, the the electronic Devel local development investment program or EL. LDIP is part of the planning process uh, that we are instituting at the local level. So this is um, 
an ongoing effort. We have started this uh, since 2020. Uh, medyo na in view of the pandemic, but this is an ongoing effort and it will uh, have its full blast implementation by 2022, uh, which will coincide with the budgeting investment programming process of local government units uh, after the new set of officials sits in. Mm -hmm. Director Bonagua, you mentioned in your uh, comments that the Growth Equity Fund is, uh, okay, oh, wait, wait ma'am, okay. It was mentioned that the Growth e Equity Fund is time-bound and performance-based, no? So by performance-based, uh, are you referring to any incentive uh, program here or and how how is it going to be implemented uh, if it is performance-based? Would you have already uh you know uh some um uh, set of criteria on how how this is going to to be implemented ma'am well initially uh uh the criteria for the gf has to be uh well approved by the dbcc but the, the dbm and with the oversight agencies including the ILG have suggested or uh proposed some of the criteria for the qualification of LGs for the GEF and these are the following out. It should they should belong to the poorest half of the LGUs within the given level or provinces, cities, municipalities. And uh, they should have a capacity per capita national tax allotment below the median within okay. the given level. Mm -hmm. And does not belong to uh, BARM because uh, the BARM have a, they they have they their have separate their, yeah their own policy for the devolution. Uh -huh. And they should be in in the at the provincial, city, and municipal level. No, we have not included the barangays for this time because the the proposed allocation is just ten billion. So I think this will not be enough to cover mm -hmm. all uh, leading uh, local government units. Uh, in terms of the performance based, uh, uh, well, the policy well, pro that has been proposed that the LGU should be able to graduate from the GF. So the, after okay. being given. Uh, for a period of, let's say, maximum of three years, they should be able to elevate their level mm -hmm. of development at a certain mm -hmm. point where they can be uh, somehow comparative to the rest of the local governments and we move on to supporting other local government units. So th I think that's the, the, the concept of the performance base that has been uh, conceptualized under the GEF. Thank you very much, Director Anna. Very valuable information regarding the, the Growth uh, Equity Fund. Okay. Um, May we also hear the thoughts of uh, uh, Fabiano? Um, one of the questions posed by Lemuel, uh, there was a series of questions, is uh, the learnings from best practices done by other countries in terms of budgeting framework. And given your uh, extensive experience working, you know, in uh, many regions of the world, would you have any uh, learnings for the Philippines that you can recommend? <laughs> um in terms of you know uh effective uh, budgeting frameworks as well as uh, um key indicators of impacts and returns of uh exp of investments of these investments uh fabian thank you very much i think that's a very broad question and maybe yes, we it is. a specific uh, webinar on that uh, but it's <laughs> a very relevant question given the fiscal times and so i mean let me start by saying that usually as they're saying, let no fiscal crisis go to waste. So uh, during tough times, it's, a, it's actually an opportune time to improve uh, budgeting systems and, uh, and processes to make uh, improve the allocative efficiency, but also the operational efficiency. And, and uh, we see that uh, with this ma major shifts, uh, which, which are happening now. I think uh, in the Philippines, and uh, I'm, I worked there quite quite some time ago, so my information may be a bit dated, but uh, uh, I see that the, the different ingredients are there. Right? There's really a macro macro fiscal uh, planning and programming. And there is uh, the some uh, initial aspects of program budgeting uh, with the program uh, project and activity aspects, which uh, help align the policy priorities with the allocations. Um, and I think it's, we saw that in uh, Dr. Justin's uh, analysis. So that's really something which is uh, great and could maybe be taken a bit forward um, to really structure real programs uh, and really structure the, the budget around these programs where you can bring together the capital expenditures, the current expenditures, uh, having real sector perspectives. 
I think one challenge which was noted and also in the agriculture sector uh, and, and agree with uh, Professor Ang is that when something of these sectors are very devolved, it's very difficult uh, to make a judgment call if you only look at the national government allocation. You would actually need to have a real sector-wide allocation and trying to see where the funds go. And that's, I guess, um, the Achilles heel uh, of the Philippine PFM system is that there isn't an information system in place that enables that. You know, so it's it's very fragmented budget information and data, and it's uh, and it's not always uh, consistent. And there's also a timeliness issue, which makes it very hard uh, to really to really optimize your budgeting and assess the impact of the budgeting. So I think my my number one recommendation would really be that is equip yourself with information system to be able to inform uh, your fiscal management, inform your budget management. And then the other aspects in terms of performance objectives and indicators can come later. But uh, knowing where the funds are going uh, at the different levels of government, how they're being spent, that's, that's key. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian. OK, let us um, entertain um, other questions. OK, we have another question from uh, one of our Facebook viewers, Mr. Julius uh, Perez Relampagos. And uh, Justine, this is specifically addressed to you. Does the proposed 2022 budget support um, have a policy have certain policy initiatives that address the challenges of rising digital economic transaction on the administration of value added tax on digital goods and services? As companies adopt new business models to cope with um, the COVID-19 lockdowns and quarantines, um, you may have uh, encountered, you know, uh, specific details in the budget, in the in the NEP, no, um, regarding uh, this, Justine. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that uh, question. Is the did I understand it correctly? Are there any items in the budget? Are there, that yes. Are there up? any um, items in the <clears throat> budget uh, addressing challenges of rising economic uh, transa digital transactions um, on the administration of value added tax? Um, so uh, pertaining to uh, digital ta taxation. Mm -hmm. Not that I have, there is an allocation for the BIR BOC, but I haven't looked at it on detail. The mm -hmm. bulk of the budget under the METI Convergence Program actually mm -hmm. falls under just building the infrastructure itself, investing in the infrastructure. There are also allocations, let's say, for the DOST, the implementation of the K-12 program to help um, facilitate um, education services, as well as in the case of SUC. So this is what I, I, I got to look at more. But um, I haven't, I think the digital taxation still, it's a bill and we're still discussing and figuring out how to, how to, you know, how to really take advantage of that. And I think uh, that Professor Ang also, Alvin mentioned this also earlier, the, the importance of uh, yeah. tapping this as well. As well as yeah. Fabian, he also mentioned it also. As a, yeah, he also mentioned mm -hmm. it as an important source of perhaps um, trying to be responsible in the fiscal consolidation uh moving forward of the, in the medium term for the next administration so so thank you yeah you're right you're right it, it was mentioned mm -hmm. by by fabian as one of the measures under revenue uh side it can be uh considered okay um let us okay let me go back to our uh questions from our chat box okay we have a, another question from antonio avila and this is um, regarding the need to reform the era formula. Um, let me read uh, what you wrote. Several studies, some by the ILG, have concluded that there is a need to reform the era formula or the internal revenue allotment formula to address the vertical inequalities. The Landanus Garcia ruling of the Supreme Court did not touch this distribution formula. So, the Mandanas exacerbated such inequalities among the LGUs. There is the GEF, but unfortunately, this will be reduced from eight billion to four billion, indicating the uncertainty of such funding. Would it, would have it been better if the national government pushed for a different formula for the additional funds brought by uh, the Mandanas ruling? Uh, Director Bonagua, would you have any thoughts on this, ma'am? 
Uh, I think that's a, a difficult question. And uh, actually, uh, the DILG has been pushing for the uh, the DILG did a review of the ERA formula several times, and we have uh, submitted this proposal to Congress. But I think uh, the quest the, the the answer now is at the hands of our legislator to pass and select from the I think nine plus one formulation on the on how ERA will be distributed to local government units, considering taking into consideration the capacity and performance of the local governments in addition to to uh, to land area, equal sharing and population. So we, we are still maintaining and uh, doing our advocacy for the review of the distribution formula for the NTA, especially that it, it increases. Thank you very much, uh, Director Badagwa, ma'am. Uh, may we hear your updates? Uh, because this, well, um, this was part, uh, you should be part of your uh, remarks, Kanina, but due to lack of time, no, you reserve it for the open forum. May we hear your updates on the devolution transition plans, ma'am? Um, okay, may I request uh, so that we can uh, show you a, a slide uh, regarding yeah, okay. this? Okay. So, uh, Actually, the submission of the devolution transition plan by local government units is ladderized. Now, the barangays uh, had their deadlines in October, on October 13, uh, 2021. So, sila yung una. They were given 60 days to formulate their uh, DTPs. The component cities and municipalities had their deadlines, deadline on November 12 that gave them 90 days. While provinces, city, uh, provinces highly urbanized cities and independent component uh, cities as well as the cities and, and the one municipality in the national capital region have their, will have their deadline this coming December 12. So, so far, as you can see from the screen, this is the status of submission of our local government units and we are really proud to uh, report that 95% uh, of all barangays, no, excluding ARM, uh, have submitted their DTPs uh, and that uh, leaves only uh, 5%. No? We have uh, 37,480 barangays out of the 42,000 plus barangays that have already their DTP submitted. While for cities and uh, independent uh, component cities and municipalities, uh, the status right now is 72% uh, submission out of the, of the 1,500 or more cities and municipalities. We have 1,000. Um, uh, 63 cities and municipalities that have completed. And I think uh, we already have um, five regions with completed uh, submission at the city level. And they were awaiting for the submission of the remaining 27, 28% of the cities and municipalities. While for uh, the provincial H2C and IC the NCR local government units, while they, they will have their deadline this coming December 12th, uh, there are around already eight provinces that have submitted uh, their DTPs no, to the DILG and that comprise 7% and will await for the deadline of, for the submission of the remaining 93% of the provinces, HUCs, ICCs, and NCRLGUs. So this is the status of the DTP. So a plan completion and while we are awaiting the DILG with our uh, the other oversight agencies doing the analytics for mm -hmm. uh, of the DTPs, uh, we're uh, summarizing, uh, at least uh, getting a sense of what uh, LGs have indicated, what are the services or mm -hmm. that they are fully assuming and what are the capacity requirements that they have put there so that national government can address this capacity, the, this lack of capacity, as well as uh, the number of personnel that they wish to uh, create in order for them to assume a uh, new devolved function. So these are the things that we are uh, summarizing or randomly checking in the LGU submission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bonago. And you mentioned in your remarks that uh, the DTP, the DT, the DTPs also contain a revenue mobilization uh, strategy. Am I am I right? Hi, ma'am. Okay, I think uh, Director Banago has uh, a support internet connection. Yes. Um, yes, oh, Sheila. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, the revenue mobilization and uh, is uh, one of the six components. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Although your your connection, ma'am, is choppy, it's it's okay, ma'am. If you will uh, 
disable your video for now so that we can hear you well. Hello. Hello, Sheila, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you now, po. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Okay. Uh, we can go back to uh, Director Bonagua and uh, let's um, have another question. Okay, let me just read what uh, Asik Rep Pineda of Neda wrote on our chat box. And uh, I think this pertains to our earlier conversation on uh, monitoring. Okay, he said, uh, improvement in budget utilization is not only a matter of presence or one monitoring is done, but the utilization of or subsequent action and information from monitoring for improved budget execution, an opportunity for improvement both for uh, national, the national government and our LGUs. Thank you uh, for that uh, insight, uh, Sec. Greg Pineda. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if um, Director Banagua, can you hear me now, ma'am? Hello? Okay. Let's go back to that Director Bonagua later. Yes, Sheila. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Hello, Sheila. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you yes. now. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Regarding the revenue mobilization strategy, this is one among the six components of the LGDTP uh, that we're asking local government units to submit. Okay. Thank you. We got your response, ma'am. Thank you very much for that. Okay, let's go to uh, jump to another question. And uh, we have one here from uh, Nether Region 2 from Marielle Kalima. And this one is for um, Justine and again for Director Bonagua. So Justine, you may want to um, comment or give your response first. Um, let me read um, what uh, Marielle wrote regarding the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict and or the NTFLCAC support to the to Barangay Development Program. Um, where is the budget lodged or allocated? If approved as previously done in 2021, would it be again? Would would it be against the Mandanas Garcia ruling given that its proposed project types are one farm to market road, two school building, three health station, four water and sanitation system, four uh, five rural electrification, six agriculture livelihood and technical vocational training projects, and seven assistance to indigent individuals or families. Um. Would you like to take a crack at this first? Uh, yes, I, I can. I can take a crack at it, Sheila. But I think <clears throat> it would be Director Benagua who would really have the more accurate answer, since yes. this is this would be under the DILG um, mm -mm. supervision oversight mm -hmm. as well as the DBM. So the NTFL CAC is actually under what you call the ALGU, which I presented earlier, assistance to local government units. It's under the Barangay Development Fund, and correctly, it was implemented starting last year. For the barangays, uh, they would be given for the barangays that were successfully cleared of insurgents. Um, they would be given 20 million each. And I believe in the 2022 budget, the proposal is about 28 point, uh, 21.8, uh, 28.12 billion. And it's the same both in the president's budget as well as the house version that was approved. So it was not changed in the house version. Now, it asked if this would be, uh, 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 against the Mandanas Garcia ruling, I think it would be best for for the DILG to respond to this. But but in if if we assume that those um, barangays that were you know conflict uh, afflicted or had insurgents present with them were the poorer and more disadvantaged ones, this may fall under more of the purview of giving assistance to the poorer or disadvantaged municipalities. So so that's all that I can say because um, I think yeah, I'm not implementing it. So it would be better that the ILG or DBM perhaps answer this. So thank you. Yes, totally understandable, Justine. Director Banagua, ma'am, uh, did you hear the question? Hello? Director Banagua. Okay, I don't think she's she's ready. Perhaps uh, her internet connection is not Hello, yet. Uh, yes, okay. ma'am. Sheila. 
Yes, did Sorry, you hear the question? Yeah. It's okay, ma'am. Did you uh, hear the question regarding the NTFL cap? Or would you like me to repeat this? Uh, okay, I, I, actually, I, I think I got it. Uh, sorry, I have to transfer because of my internet connection. No problem, ma'am. We understand. Okay. Okay. Mom, we don't hear you. Okay. Uh, we lost her again. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you now. I will uh, just like, open my my. Yes, my yes, please. Okay. It, it, it's okay. You, do, you, you can just disable your video, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to... <laughs> Uh, crack an answer because that is uh, this particular program is not uh, exactly under my uh, my supervision. But I think um, the our the the support to barangays uh, is in support of the implementation of the default functions of the local government units, particularly the barangays. And this is our way of capacitating, no, hand in hand with the concerned national government agencies, capacitating the barangay on how to implement programs at their level, uh, considering that uh, we have eliminated uh, the threat of insurgency within this area. So uh, this does not go against uh, the Mandanas ruling, much more this um, um, implements and parang put to test how we can properly guide and assist uh, local governments in the efficient implementation of the programs and, and in, in deciding and planning uh, what the constituency needs in their particular locality. I think that's all, Sheila. Thank you very much, Director Bonaga. And we have another uh, question here from uh, CPBRD Director Pamela Diaz Manalo. No? And this is also for you, Director Bonago. You mentioned a while ago about the, the DTPs. No? So his, her question is, how does the national government intend to match DTPs of LGUs and the NGAs uh, with devolved functions, with respect to devolved functions or services? to ensure smooth transition and avoid gaps in service delivery. Okay, yeah. um, actually, th th that has been the question when we started uh, the planning for the transition to devolution. It's, it's really very hard, which should come first. Uh, but then what happens is that uh, nauna ang local governments in the preparation of your DTPs because the national government, while they have completed, it has to undergo the review of DBM within the 120 days. And that will, that will uh, be... Uh, uh, far beyond the deadline given to local government units. So what, what's happening right now uh, is that the LGs have are completing or have some, some most of them have completed their DTPs in time for implementation for next year, which will uh, mostly uh, uh, provide uh, the services that they really have to assume based on the the local government code and the laws and not yet including the PPAs that are being undertaken previously by local by the national government agencies. But come after election uh, with new set of officials and when the DTPs of the national government agencies have been reviewed and are ready to be shared uh, by DBM, uh, I think that will be the time for the for our local government units to go over the DTPs again for implementation for the next two years of transition, which is 2023 and 2024, benefiting already from the DTPs of the national government agency. So I think that will, that will, what will happen in the next years. In as much as we want uh, that there be a really a, a, a close um, uh, coordination while preparing both DTPs, no, it's really very hard uh, uh, to uh, <laughs> well to manage so it, some somehow one of the DTPs by either national or local government has to come first and then the, the the DTPs of the national government have to adapt with the requirements of the local government unit so I think that's <laughs> what's happening right now. Thank you very much, Director Bonago. We still have a few questions in our chat box and for from Facebook, but let me give um uh, Fabian um. Um, to say a few, um, like, let me give him uh, uh, some time to say a few words because he needs to leave for another equally important uh, event. Fabian, would you have anything, some last words to say um, to our audience? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's not an equally important event and I would have loved to stay in this event. Uh, but that's, that's really great. But, but thank you very much for having me here. I mean, this, uh, today's discussion really raised very important points. Uh, which may require further discussions um, in more depth, notably on the fiscal transfer and equalization system. So really great to hear that there have been 
uh, a few uh, proposals already made by the LG. I think uh, PIDS also had a very good event last year on that. Uh, so, I mean, it would be great to see if maybe that's something that could be picked up again and maybe also uh, the growth and equity fund, uh, which is very important in the meantime to really address this um, vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalances, which come from these additional resources and from the disconnect between the, the transfer of functions and the costing of these functions and the resource transfer. So, um, great to, to, to be with you and maybe uh, looking forward to continue this conversation. But just the last point on agriculture, there has been a lot of interest and discussion on that. Just uh, a note for information that the World Bank is currently doing a public expenditure review of the agri agricultural se uh, sector. And so that's something uh, which we'll also be happy to share uh, as soon as it's ready. So uh, looking forward to uh, continuing interacting and thank you very much uh, to, to you, uh, uh, Justin, um, Dr. Professor Hang and, uh, and Director Anna for today's discussion. Thank you. And thank you very much. We look forward to having you again at, uh, thank you, Fabian. in the future. Thank you again, Mr. Fabian Seder of the World Bank. Okay, so friends, let's continue our conversation. We have uh, some more questions here. And uh, this one is again from uh, Director Pamela Manalo of CPBRD. And it's about the growth um, equity fund or the GEF. Uh, how different is the growth equity fund from the financial assistance to LGUs, both under LGSF, in terms of projects that will be funded? When can we expect the IRR um, for the GEF? I understand, if correct me if I'm wrong, that the growth equity fund replaces the LGSF AI, um, AM program. Uh, Dr. Director Bonagua, I, I think that was what she said. And also, Justin, I think you pointed this out too. Um, okay, perhaps, um, okay, Director Bonagua, may we hear your response on this? How um, different, yes? Yes, How actually, uh, yeah, as, as you have mentioned, uh, the GEF uh, now replaces the, the various LGS, LGSF programs that we have before, like Silent Too Big, uh, yes. Two mm -hmm. Roads. Uh, this consolidated uh, all that, the, that, that budget allocation for local government units, but giving the local government units the leeway to define the program that is needed by their locality instead of national government, providing a menu of the programs that can be uh, access by local government units. So that, that, that I think that's the difference. So it's a, 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 a lump sum allocation for them to allocate to where they think this is needed based on what they have uh, indicated in their devolution transition plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Director Bonagua. And, and uh, another, okay, this time we have a question from um, Asik Reg Pineda. In managing the full devolution transition, will there be a difference if the 2022 budget of concerned NGAs is more regionalized or more centralized? Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I should throw this to Director Bonago because this concerns about, you know, the NGAs. Justine, would you have any information on this? Um. That's a tough question. Let me try and <laughs> break it down. So in managing the full devolution transition, will there be a difference if the 2022 budget of the constraint is more regionalized or more centralized? more centralized? I think this really would need someone, you know, from the government uh, to answer this. Uh, yeah, that's uh, is Director Anna around. Um, Director Anna? Uh, it depends. Well, let me take a crack now. Just a hunch. Yeah. If their function is actually devolved according to Section 17 of the Local Government Code, then there might be a difference during the transition period. The transition period for the Mandana's implementation and the redevolution would be from 2022 to 2024. Mm -hmm. So gradually, year by year, the LGUs will will identify which are their priorities and which they can absorb or which they need more time to prepare for. So that's how I understand the devolution transition plan to be designed. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the additional information there. Now, it depends on the NGA if their function is part of those really that are devolved or not. That's that's all that I think I can uh, safely answer about that. So, so thank you. It's, yeah. it's okay, Justine. Okay. 
I think we have um okay I think we have exhausted all our questions from our virtual from our Facebook and uh, WebEx participants and so at this point okay let me ask our um our speakers um well to cap our discussion may I ask each of you for your brief uh final remarks okay let me start from justine and then uh we'll go to um director bonagua and of course uh professor and justine any final thoughts that you may want to share to our <laughs> participants yes uh thank you thank you and thank you also for listening thank you also to the to the discussants here present and as i mentioned as, as part of my recommendations the challenge of the next administration would really be fiscal consolidation without sacrificing the much needed um, human capital and infrastructure investments. So there should be jo combined job creation for economic recovery. And here I'd like to highlight the contribution of Alvin earlier, Professor Ang, when he mentioned that there are disrupted and actually destructed industries that would require massive um, upscaling and retooling of the labor markets. So this should also be part of the 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 policies moving forward in the next administration in order to be able to you know get people jobs so that um the whole economy can recover but at the same time um there's also a need for strategic investment in physical and human infrastructure and uh, in physical capital and infrastructure and um the private question earlier i think it was by director bangsal of the cpbrd he said What's the most progressive way for fiscal consolidation? Apart from you know improving investment spending at the local level, there are already available right now um, a list, a long list of investment programs at the national level that have already been studied, whose, whose contribution that the contribution to the economy has already been studied, and it's already there are already funding sources available from ADB, uh, GIBC and from from other development partners so these are the build 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 projects so so it would be easy to get more progressive investment infrastructure because the the the, the programs that have already been examined um to contribute considerably to the economy but at the same time there should also be capacity building which is what director anna bonagua earlier highlighted so not just at the local level but also at the national level so moving forward you know everybody has a role to play um, local governments and national government as well have their own contribution to national growth and development. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to um, Justine. Okay, Director um, Director Bonago, ma'am, any final thoughts? Any final remarks for our participants? Um, well, th thank you, Sheila. Well, considering that the the bulk of the national expenditure will go. Uh, at the local level, no, that 20% or so. Uh, national government agency guidance and support for the efficient budget utilization, I think it's very important. No, more than more than the expenditure assignments, no, where where budget should be expended. The resulting outcome uh, should be uh, uh, first and foremost the consideration, which definitely needs alignment, harmonization, less of duplication, and more of the guidance by the national government agency to, uh, for local government units so that we can expect uh, the service delivery and vision by our national, the, the, the PDP and the national government priority trust. So I think the seamless coordination and partnership between national and local governments yes. lead us to the expectation of the outcomes and, well, self-reliant and national development. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Bonagua. And of course, uh, Professor Alvin Anser. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I think much has already been said about, uh, you know, how to do, go about with the budget. Um, my, my thinking is just <clears throat> that this is not a one off thing. Um, the thing is, uh, the, the impact of the pandemic will be more than two years. So, I mean, we have lost a lot already in terms of human capital and in terms of uh, physical capital. So how do you recover? And so that's why this budget is very important. It's going to be instructive. Unfortunately, there's no learning curve. The LGUs, the local, the, the national government simply has to push itself, but we are going into a transition year. So there's so many 
uh, factors that will you know either push it or hang it back or push, pull it back but then uh, you know we cannot wait because the the scars caused by the pandemic uh, may not be repairable immediately so you know uh, I think early this early the adapta adaptable budget or adaptive budget should this be start the so we, we should start preparing for an adaptive budget. Uh, you know, there's a lot of change that the pandemic has caused. So we can now work from home wherever we are and still be productive. But then what about those who can? And, and there are many of them. And those will be, you know, how, how, how does the budget works along that line? That, that's, a, I think, a very basic question because that's also how education will work, how health will work. Um, and many government processes. So moving forward, uh, even without the Mandanas Garcia ruling, we still have to do something to uh, to help cushion the long-term impact of the pandemic. So that, I think that's that's what I would like to contribute. Thanks, thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alvin Ann. So friends, please join me in thanking our very own uh, fiscal policy specialist fiscal policy expert at PIDS, Dr. Justin Seacott, for sharing her study. And of course, our external group of experts who serve as our panel of reactors for this afternoon. Director um, Annalisa Bonagua of the DILG, Mr. Uh, Fabian Sederer of the World Bank, and Professor Alvin Ang of the Ateneo de Manila University. Let us, go, let us give them a big virtual clap. We hope that this webinar has given everyone not just greater uh, clarity of the national expenditure program for 2022 or the president's budget and how um, it embodies the priorities of the national government but also uh, what needs to be done to ensure responsible accountable effective and efficient utilization of public funds um it, it remains to be seen uh, how the final version of the national budget will look like but hopefully it is something that truly is responsive to the country's pressing needs as we endeavor to recover from this pandemic. Okay, so, okay, before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. From Webex, we have Mia Onkit, um, Renisa Dizon, and Christian Guspid. And from Facebook, Edward Perez and Vivian Danao Lucas. So Mia Onkit, Renisa Dizon, Christian Guspid, Edward Perez, and Vivian Danao Lucas, our webinar team will contact you for your prize. Okay. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so you, you can access the uh, presentations from uh, today's webinar from the PIDS website, including the um uh, um study the full study of Dr. Justin Seacat, okay? And also please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email, email you the link after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. Please also uh, regularly visit our um, website and social media pages. Thanks once again to all those who tune in to our Facebook page and those who uh, um uh followed our live tweets sa aming twitter account okay and finally we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government academy civil society business and international development community who join us today so friends this concludes our webinar series for uh 2021 uh, we conducted, if I'm not mistaken, more than 31 uh, public webinars this year, and all of them were well attended because of your support. So we hope you will continue patronizing our webinar series next year. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next year. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, everyone.